Welcome everyone. So far we have Andrew, Jan, Jesse, John, and myself, Michael. I'm sure others will trickle in. Some friendly reminders, have your links ready to drop in chat or the document. And a point I haven't emphasized is that I want these to be low stress. If you cannot attend, feel free to get your questions on the doc and uh, we will get them in as best we can and because they probably interest other people. The recording of the last meeting is up on YouTube. I do have access to the open ZFS channel and Matt and I will find a, the right balance of where to host it and where to have a playlist, et cetera, et cetera. And I will fix the calendar invitation that I put on the doc. I need to remove my personal entries and then make it fully public, which was not super clear from our friends at Google. And perhaps we'll move to a different uh, platform. And from the last meeting, there was discuss, uh, discussions of direct I.O. and Alan Jude came back with some news, but let's see if the user involved with that, I believe it was, uh, who was it? I think, I believe it was Stu discussing that, but you can look into that. So that's for the future topic. Uh, there was a question about OpenZFS on, Open on Windows. I'm happy to discuss that, but Jesse, you mentioned that you had a surprise from the host ID command on uh, Linux. Could you tell us what happened and how to avoid it? Uh, yeah, so the um, as far as I know, the safety mechanisms to prevent dual import on ZFS, there's the there's MMP, uh, which we used to run, but no longer do because MMP depends on ZFS being able to write through storage pools at a specified interval. I think the default is 10 seconds. If MMP writes fail, ZFS will offline your pool. And I don't think there's a way to online the pool without rebooting your host. Um, so that was kind of a misfeature for us. Uh, the more primitive uh, means of safety is for ZFS to write the system host ID to a storage pool on import. Uh, and then uh, any subsequent imports compare the uh, importing systems host ID to the host ID written on the pool. And if they differ, ZFS will throw up some error messages. And if you use import F, uh, ZFS will import it uh, anyway. Um, the problem that we ran into, or just because of assumption, assumptions that I made, uh, the GNU host ID command will, uh, as far as I can tell, never return a value of zero. Uh, GNU host ID works very hard to fabricate information for you. So even if the SPL believes the host ID to be zero, which you should specifically check, the host ID might say something completely different. Uh, so we ran import on, well, I had a typo and ended up importing a storage pool on two different systems, uh, because I didn't understand the way, uh, GNU host ID behaves. Um, anyway, um, if you have an Etsy host ID file, you shouldn't have problems because host ID should read from that. And the SPL should as well. Um, and ZGen host ID comes with ZFS specifically, so you can go generate host ID files on systems that don't have them. Um, but yeah, just be aware of the fact that you can manually set a host ID for the SPL uh, in your in your kernel modules, whatever the modules.d directory in Etsy. Uh, and the, the host ID will happily make up a different host ID when you run that command. So um, yeah, pay more attention to what's going on with the SPL. Um, what the user land utility says may have nothing to do with what ZFS is doing. Let me say in short. So are you doing multipath SAS to the two different systems? Uh, uh, in this case, it wasn't multipath. It was just it was just single connection. But yes, uh, our storage arrays were connected to multiple systems. Um, and uh, yeah, typed the wrong thing, but I didn't use the force flag. So I assumed the safety would catch me. And thanks to a gross misunderstanding of how host ID behaves on Linux systems, um, that safety did not save us. Goodness, I hope that was not too brutal a recovery. It was a mess. Um, oh, sorry. We well, I mean, it was, it actually went really smoothly, but I mean, there, I don't, that was way beyond my 
knowledge or skill level to take care of, but uh, we hired uh, Clara Systems and Alan and uh, Rob did all the data recovery and did a fantastic job. Right. So I didn't like being in that position, but I have nothing but good things to say about them. Understood. Well, and you uh, had you not bumped into this, I'm sure someone would in the future. So thank you for that. And Jan has a question. Where do you store the host ID for the root pool import? I assume it's root on the ZFS. You store the host ID for the... So Jan, do you want to clarify that? Or did you tell you you're on? Uh, that was just a cheap shot from the side that you can't rely on the file system when importing your uh, root boot tool. Ah, got it. I mean, I think that would only be a problem if your root file system is on something dual connected, but if your setup is that complex, you're probably smart enough to <laughs> to, to not get tripped up by this. <laughs> our Famous setup, last words. Yeah, our, our, <laughs> setup, our setup is not quite that tricky, so we don't have to worry about that. If, for example, in a just in a setup similar to what I'm running in my home lab, where virtual machines with ZFS on root root from uh, VIO SCSI devices, if I were to uh, accidentally expose the same LAN to two virtual machines at the same time, and they happen to boot uh, using ZFS on Linux. Uh, this would have uh, shredded my data. So uh, in a virtualized environment, it's very easy to accidentally expose two uh, virtual machines to the same boot device. Cool. Uh, that said, uh, John, do you have a 1970 hard drive in back making seek noises? <laughs> And do you have any experiences related to this? I apologize for that. I just got my, I got my microphone fixed. Okay. Uh, do you have any wisdom regarding uh, host ID management? Okay, no worries. I think in uh, Linux, you can pass it in as a, to the, from the bootloader to the kernel. So the kernel gets one from the bootloader, but of course it doesn't help you if the bootloader takes it from some file system, even if it's only a read-only uh, Fed32 or something. And if you boot from the same device, it will be the same stored host ID. So then you have to get it from your hypervisor or from your hardware. Understood. So that said, anything else relating to that topic? And gen host ID, I probably have that command wrong. So let me look that up. DFS gen host ID is our hyphen. Nope, that's it. It's, it's Z it's, gen host ID. It, yes, it's prefixed by a Z. I uh, just to answer your question, um, I basically force the host UUID to a uh, a value that has the, of course, the e, the MAC address in the tail end. Um, and I do that at startup at all times to make sure that I don't ever have a, a, a dual hosted system where they are the same. Nice. Is and that a one liner sometime. you can share? Oh, I've got it here somewhere. Cool. <laughs> You're saying young. So on most hypervisors, there is a setting to set the, to pass through a host ID to the guest. And on actual hardware, you're kind of at the mercy of firmware, which means uh, sometimes it's, for example, possible to set the host ID via the BMC. And sometimes you're just out of luck and it's all zeros. Change it. Oh. Uh, some, something else to be aware of is that yes, sometimes um, uh the the host id check will work if you if you do an import on host a and then wait for the import to complete and then go over to host b and try the import without the force flag and it should fail uh but if you try the import at the same time on two systems like i was just testing this yesterday in a virtual environment it'll work fine uh so uh that safety check won't catch all scenarios 
Uh, so you use the phrase work fine, meaning both will attempt to import. <laughs> Uh, it will mm -hmm. work fine as in not do what you want uh, and get around the safety. Uh, okay. so, so yeah, so that that safety mechanism uh, will save you if you are not doing your imports in parallel. Okay, cool. I have also played around with either allocating an entire drive um, or an offset on a drive and the active host uh, pushes a counter, for instance, into that singular block. Um, and then I watch that block on the other host. And if that uh, update does not occur, um, I view that as a uh, kill the kill the other host and then take it over. So um, I don't have access to a large enough lab environment at the moment, but um, I've played around with using SCSI persistent reservations for this. And if there's a timeout and one node thinks it should be the master because it considers the other node down, it will make sure to uh, use the power distribution units to cut both of its phases. Uh, but such a complicated setup is basically beyond most users. And even I failed to find any good documentation on how to use the SG3 tools to uh, acquire the uh, persistent reservations, break them if a node fails in the right, right way, because sometimes you may detect that a node really panicked but didn't reboot, and so the HBA still holds the blocks and so on. So it's, it's a mess. So uh, what would handle your arbitration, like Corosync or something? Uh, in my experiments, I basically had two nodes with CARP, uh, but I only used CARP to check for the liveness of the other node, because two nodes can't form a quorum. So instead, I uh, used SCSI per, uh, assisted reservations on uh, five disks to uh, get a quorum among the um, SCSI disks. OK, and how's that exposed to the user? Uh, through command line tools. Well, can you be more specific? SG free SG utils. OK, thank you. Uh, uh, Jesse, were you jumping in? Uh, I was just going to say, John. One of the one of the problems that uh, we didn't we didn't so much have problems discerning when nodes were misbehaving. Uh, a big problem that we ran into was some of our storage pools were taking. I think the longest import time we saw was like eighteen minutes. Um, but wow. for us, like that was ridiculous. Like you really can't. I mean, if you if you are willing to adjust your cluster settings to be patient enough to wait for something like that, there's really no point using a cluster anymore. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, anyway, yeah, our, our experience trying to make ZFS work in some sort of quasi dodgy HA fashion has been, I would say relatively poor. Uh, but if you've had better luck with that, I'd be really interested in chatting with you offline about it. Oh, that's actually very much a hot topic for this forum. Just saying, uh, any notion of HA is important. It came up with me and a colleague just yesterday. So I think it's fair game. Yeah, that's one of the, so Michael, I had made a comment in one of the meetings a while back. I don't remember exactly which one, but the 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 concept of HA is something that we we seem to ignore a bit in the in the wikis and everything. You know, it, we we do these demos of here's how to set things up, but then when HA comes along, it's like we wave our hands and say, "Yeah, it works." Um and it's it does work, but it it, it is complicated, um, and maybe folks don't agree with that statement that way. But that's just the way I I explain it to people. Um, thoughts welcome. Automatic active passive fail over and fail back is dark black magic. Uh, to get working in any way that you can sleep soundly. Agreed. And I'll flat out say, I mean, thank you, AI, for pointing out the potential issues. Computers stink at making decisions. And I'd rather a human make that final 
switch over decision. I want all the warnings from the machine, great. But when it comes to a decision with massive repercussions, as Jesse's pointed out, uh, I still think the humans are potentially better. And that's fascinating about the 18 minute timeout where we all picture every system just magically flipping over and nothing being visible to the user. But up the stack, even if your storage was HA, does that mean your network connections are handed over? Is your virtual machine memory content synchronized like some of the higher end VMware tools such that everything is transparently and magically handed over? I think we're just talking like unicorn territory here. But hey, let's explore what pragmatically we can achieve. There, I yeah, said. Porting ZFS to a lockstep machine. Mm -hmm. Lockstep machine. Do give an example. Um, old mainframes where basically two systems were running a half a cycle ahead of each other, and if one fails, the other basically doesn't take the next cycle. Uh, there are even systems with three systems and three comparators uh, so that you have the feeling of running a system, but it's really three systems basically taking a vote on every instruction in hardware across. And it's outside of certain control systems, it's just gone and will not come back for latency and throughput reasons. So I believe QEMU will do lockstep systems. Interesting. Uh, as in they have this in software or you can run real world workloads on it? I know I was looking at it a few years ago and I, I know they were uh, working on some stuff. I I don't know the current, I apologize. I don't know don't the worry, current hey. status. Uh, and was that a debugging tool or is that in fact a high availability tool? Because I know there's like single stepping the VM. Um, I say my understanding, I was looking at doing something with it and it was more of a high availability, but I, I can try to Google it and see. Yeah, if I can so that's the same. Go ahead. So the old things like the nonstop servers or uh, VEX FT were really uh, unicorn machines of their time. What was the um, VAX, VAX, what? VAX fault tolerant. Okay. So VAX FT, uh, it's 80s and 90s technology. So, uh, all right. Yeah. And I've only read about them, also short, low resolution documentation videos on them. Basically, they pumped on the problem of making the software fault tolerant and high available by making the hardware ridiculously uh, reliable. Mm -hmm. So that the operating system, for example, doesn't have to support failover between different implementations because your one implementation, as long as there's no panic, will just work even if you have to replace a CPU. That's transparent to the OS? Yes. Mm. Impressive. Uh, it, it, it is impressive. My favorite story about fault tolerant hardware was a VAX one. The only time they saw a fault, they went out there to check it out and somebody had stole the entire building. This was in Iraq. My, my, my. Yeah, um, HP had a do uh, an ad for their fault tolerant machines where they emptied uh, an M14 magazine into the server. With uh, piercing ammunition, they just sh showed that you could have bullet holes going through the system, and the other rack would just run fine. I believe Sequent here in Oregon, which had multi socket i386 yeah. systems, were indeed like, hey, pull them out as you go. Okay, tell us about the what? QEMU Colo. This is some of the stuff I was referring to, but it's probably been three plus years since I, I messed with this stuff. Um, and sorry for going off on a tangent that uh, this is interesting. It's basically what you do if you can't make the software handle the problem. And 
storage is one of those cases where it's complicated because you have everything is about managing state and managing state is the hard part about failover. But unless you really need local storage with these properties, such hardware mechanisms are okay. What we are looking for and status and what most application is reliable, high available block storage or object storage, and maybe file storage. So instead, what comes on top of, for example, ZFS, the part which has to be high available. So there is a place where basically ZFS is only a very reliable middle layer. Which raises a question, where would the users here want to start? What's the first problem you'd all want to solve? Because it can, it, HA means so many things to so many election. people. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, leader election and isolation. So making sure that which is the part, so let's say I have a few J bots in a rack and two or three servers. And what I care about is that the double input protection works in the face of uh, multi pathing and multiple paths to different servers. Did I hear safe import between multiple systems? Yep. Some way of making so, sure that you, this double import is just impossible without setting the yes, I want to shoot myself in the full for data recovery flag. And that's what, how Jesse got us here. John, you had something? Um, maybe. Hang on. Okay, sure. <laughs> no worries. I'm looking. So, for example, right now I have disks in JBots, two servers having access to the JBot and manual failover. If the primary fails, I make sure that it's dead, its power is cut, uh, it won't auto boot far enough to be dangerous because it takes a disk encryption password to boot from the sheet. So, even if it comes up again, it will stop at the boot prompt of the internal drives. And then uh, I can use the cold spear uh, server to take over the disks because the the data has inertia at the scale ZFS is useful for. You have to allow another server to take over the disk arrays. You don't have to fail over the host if you're using ZFS to offer some network facing storage service. I have a diagram, it's about a decade old if you're interested in seeing it. Well, we just discussed mainframes sure. and VAXs, so yeah, that's actually pretty recent. <laughs> <laughs> and three years ago, that was like yesterday. Point. Come on, my kid, youngest is six, so that's like half her age, so come on, what you got? <laughs> yes, uh, let's bring that up, boom, okay. LSI 16E, that's like crazy recent. So 25, 60, 60 gig, that's kind of Except small. for the uh, spinning disks, people are still running this. Yeah, this is an old diagram. This is actually, I, I don't remember. I think this might have been HP gear. Um, the, uh, the shelves are uh, dual attached, obviously, as you can tell. And the, the head units... Um, you can actually have active pools the way things are set up. You can have a what I call a resource pool. Um, the drives can be allocated to head A or head B, and they will mm -hmm. both run simultaneously. But if, for yes. instance, you shut off head B, head A will take over the pools that um, it, it had that head B had. The, oh, so there are multiple pools here. Yes. Multiple pull up to, I think I supported eight at one time. The, the configuration for a pool actually lives in the pool in a config space. 
So once I import the pool onto the new head, mm -hmm. that mounts up the con so slash config slash uh, pool name. Um, mm -hmm. The configuration for that pool then comes online. And for instance, all of the NFS export information or iSCSI information all lives in that configuration space. So basically, the way I've designed it was that the configuration for a pool lives with the pool. So I can literally unplug it from a head, uh, plug it into yep. a new head, and it works with very little differencing. So you basically made the pool itself describing? As far as the... Uh... The NSF and NSF information go, NFS information goes. You kind of recreated the wheel there, because at least on original ZFS, we just stored that as part of the pool. I mean, we've got there. There are um, specific parameters that are supposed like to be for share that. NFS, I guess, and other the share, share NFS parameters. property does not carry everything you need to carry. For NFS before, for example, I no found the share NFS. <laughs> I apologize the... to anyone that I might offend here. <laughs> I found the share NFS to be unusable. Um, I have, you know, over a thousand uh, entries that I have to track, um, and share NFS doesn't it, it doesn't handle it well. Okay, I haven't had to track that many in, in mine. And it's uh, a bit hokey on FreeBSD. NFS, uh, only supports one line per uh, data set. If, like, if, if you need to, to for example, uh, share uh, root squash with, or if you need to root squash some of your exports, but no root squash other exports, I'm pretty sure you can't do that with share NFS. You actually have to use the whatever export FS uh, style. You can Depends. set more than just a yes or no. It's really a string value. So you can actually set something. You can like embed method. the carriage returns and stuff in it, but it, it really gets it just gets really hokey after a while. On which platform are you on? I'm using FreeBSD. Okay. So, on uh, on the OmniOS side of things, uh, Illumos, you don't even need carriage returns at all to do it. It would still I would still not want to do that many, to be clear, but yeah. So Powell himself admits the FreeBSD one was a bit of an afterthought, and I found it quite hokey. I found that if you unshare, you may still have the exports setting of entry in Etsy for that data set such that it's not really doing its housekeeping. But I can imagine on the Lumos derivatives, it's far more sophisticated. I mean, if this is, I think, one of those things that if we were to, you know, if we were trying to push together the um, OpenZFS and the Solaris CFS line, this sounds like it might be one of those things where if you guys could take something from ours, that might be good. Uh, I would Part of the problem is that Linux, FreeBSD, and Solaris derived operating systems all have different extended export flags so oh. these settings aren't portable if you do more than the absolute basic right well the i mean the trick is to figure out how to you know on let's say if you're on linux figure out what the linux equivalent would be for what this format is and then deal with it it's not in, it's not completely impossible it's just not necessarily easy right uh, I would, and I would even just a matrix of what is and isn't supported would be helpful go ahead 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 for posterity. Michael, please reconnect. Okay, we're here. You on a loop. Yeah, you're like on a loop, Michael. 
Okay, it stopped. Yeah, when you muted it, when it stopped doing it. And it comes back when you unmute it. Michael, uh, whenever you unmute, we hear a head on the infinite loop. <laughs> what about now? I've changed okay, that fixed it. Okay, it's a, Something a USB device, the bane of audio since the day it was introduced on that silly iMac. Go ahead, let's try again. <laughs> the original iMac still had uh, 3.5 millimeter jacks, even two of them for education purposes. This is true. Um, I just I'm thinking of all the poor MIDI users who had everything working on, say, Amiga, but then suddenly dead in the water on these iMacs. OK, so let's get these back IMAX on topic to started, portable yeah, NFS sharing. <laughs> I just wanted to provide an example of something that I do on some of the systems. Um, we I provide uh, NFS root volumes. And that's a, a simple example of one um, being provided these days with security. The IP address is typically typically brought all the way down to a slash 32, um, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Regarding NFS and security, um, what's the state of um, booting from TLS encrypted NFS shares? I do not have that working yet. Because at least on previous year, I think the server side has dropped and the normal client side has dropped, but I don't think it's possible to boot off them without maybe crazy rerouting tricks. So John, are these like net booted machines you're talking about? Yes, okay. absolutely. Wow, good. Okay, I'm glad people are exercising that. So one of the things that that allows is because it's net booted, um, I have a, a, a command you can run on the host and that allows you to snapshot, it talks to a back end system, which allows you to uh, snapshot and roll back your working image to something you had saved off in the past. Um, this allows developers to do work very quickly mm -hmm. um, and recover. And recover, yeah. And recover, key point, yes. Um, what are the advantages of uh, exporting uh, snapshotable block devices? Because I found NFS to be annoying at the best of times as a root file system because it's not quite the same. Well, not a file system, it's right in the name there. Nightmare file system. Nightmare file, that one yeah. too, yes. But one of the things that makes nice for debugging is that uh, whether it was planned or not, uh, with ZFS, the uh, snapshots show up um, on the remote host so that you can easily diff your current file system versus the previous file system, for instance. And that's a, another feature that the developers tend to really like. That was yeah, absolutely ZFS planned. Is in fact, that was in the very early versions before Sun was killed by Oracle. That was not the case. So okay. that was very much planned. But uh, well, thank you, the, the abandoning of the original port to FreeBSD and uh, the move to OpenZFS uh, on FreeBSD, you could even create a snapshot by creating a directory uh, in the snapshot directory. And oh, really? Map to a ZFS snapshot. Almost overthinking uh, I it. I think like that. Anywhere still provides the semantic. So yeah, that, a... uh, you could even create a snapshot by creating a directory without having access to the ZFS tools. Mm, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Clever. Okay, well, uh, I I do see how logically and uh, 
more accurately, here's a great way to burn users. If you have a portable pool between, say, Windows and Lumos and FreeBSD and you name it, and <laughs> Linux, and have share NFS with a simple share, there might be some expectation of that just working because, hey, it's an official ZFS feature. Jesse, you posted, some, posted something about your bug report. Let's see. Ba, 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 ba. I'll just go ahead and paste that in. If you have comments, go ahead. Uh, you say you have this bug report. Uh, well, and as far uh, as far as that kind of thing goes, I think some of that, some of the reason why maybe some of this is implemented a little more um, elegantly to the user on the Illumo side is because the Illumo side doesn't get as nitpicky about some of the, uh, you know, uh, separation of levels things the way the, the Linux side does. So, you know, if you <clears throat> if we have to tie, you know, NFS to our, yeah, if we have to tie ZFS to our NFS or SIF shares. I don't think they, you know, they cared as much. The, the point was getting the feature to where it was more usable. But that was only possible because you shipped the NFS server and the TIFF server and so on. Yeah, I mean, the operating you, uh, system. Yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Is the SIFF server useful in 2023? <laughs> yeah, I use it. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. There you go. And I, I, the, the Illumo Which SIF SMB SIF version does it implement? I would have to, I have to check. I know, it, I, I know it still gets development, but I would have to double check on the current, what current one it implements. But I very much prefer using the Illumos kernel SIF server, server over Samba. I find if you've it, got it that works. option, of course. <laughs> It, it works please better. know if it's stuck on uh, SMB version one. I don't think it is. I think they're they're okay. past that. I have to double check. I mean, I know I'm using it in Windows in a relatively up to date Windows domains. So, so some people consider this heresy, but um, something that I wouldn't mind seeing is if the some the, the share NFS or a new related option actually simply uh, used a call out mechanism uh, to to call a, a provided script or program that then allowed us to set up the uh, the, the the sharing um, it allow, allows us to use the the ZFS uh, API but have a back end that handles it which can then be done on a per uh, per host type uh, configuration. Isn't that how it's basically done on FreeBSD by having being the kernel generate a dev CTL event on uh, the wall and well, then dev D generate the export file and signal mount D? I think the idea here is to is to make a is to make like a script for that one and then maybe put the name the, the path of the script in there yes okay uh but then is that super helpful because hey your data set's probably already named nfs shares it's like oh i wonder what that's going to be doing so what, what's well, the use case that distinguishes if, it as his, super useful if his use case is having hundreds of entries then yeah oh, editing okay. that with like a text editor rather than trying to do it on something else is definitely useful. So you I could can inherit it on a whole a bunch of sub data sets, all pointing to the same canonical yes. share script. Okay, yes. getting there. And then probably grab some of that path from it, either the full path or portion of it. I, I see, okay. Let's do us to the script. Uh, would it help? But it would definitely take some thought and development to go into it. But yeah, I can see that being a useful feature that could be done. File system properties as a message bus. Uh, and that could be a just 
uh, almost a share property or share script property because it's like, well, the user knows what they're achieving with this and we'll just facilitate it. And don't get me wrong, you could use a, a private property at this time. And I think various NAS systems do something. Anyway, uh, good idea. It's just a thought on my part. It's given the scale of some of the stuff I've had to deal with, something like that would be quite helpful. So uh, you probably have all the syntax describing. within reach and you could do a private property as a proof of concept, but go ahead, Jan. One of the problems I see with this idea is that um, if I remember correctly, that I've set is basically one uh, transaction per assignment. So it's a very heavy rate pool wide operation. Yes, it's an administrative operation, which means, hey, exactly. just flush everything and say, yeah, you want to, well, you don't but, often tell it to share unless you're in maybe a highly dynamic but, hosting environment and you're constantly giving new shares, but I assume your systems aren't that dynamic, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. It, but during something like a failover event, you're doing bug modifications. And is there a batched uh, API to change <coughs> properties really in one transaction, change one property on 2000 data sets? Right. In, in my case specifically, the export information is built and put into an exports file local to my my config arena and when i move the shells over to a new head i have slightly modified the actual uh nfs uh mount d code to actually look for exports files export files in the multiple config arenas it concatenates them feeds them in and we're off and running I'm not going to rerun the, the the share NFS multiple times. I don't I, I, I don't do that. It would just get inherited and clear and record and respected on arrival. Right. Okay. They are they are implemented in such a way that I that that's not that does not need to be done. Um, what other share types is one using day to day? And shocker, I have not heard of ZFS share AFP or Andrew file system or some of the exotic things or FTP, but in practice, is it still down to NFS and SMB? Well, and iSCSI exports of uh, volumes. Correct. Oh, yeah, I have iSCSI very well. I have a um, fiber channel exports, but I'm trying yeah. to slowly get rid of them. I got rid of my fiber channel exports not too long ago, and um, I don't regret it. Hmm. The places that I've been able to get rid of it, I absolutely don't regret it already. And I want to get rid of it elsewhere. One of the comments that I might make is that while it works, it is hard to explain to other people and even harder to explain to them how to debug it and figure it out when it's not working. Because it's a complete parallel universe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I, I don't disagree with you. I'm, I'm, I'm simply trying to put some relatively nice words around why fiber channel doesn't seem to be a first class the first class implemented system well my my interest in in getting it gone isn't that i don't have a problem i haven't had a problem with that um where I, the reason i want to get rid of it is because when i'm using it it's a since it's a block device i can't expose the end users to their snapshots which means yeah. it's always a big rigmarole every time somebody wants a restore. I got to go in, I got to clone in, I got to mount the clone, I got to transfer all the stuff. It's it's a mess, and I want them to just be able to self-service that. Hmm. 
And you, you might want to put John and others in your uh, notes <laughs> there, Michael. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, we're you're, just, you're attributing an awful lot to me there, and that's hard to... You raised the talk about Sharon Affairs. Yes, I, am, uh, I know. That'll teach me to open my mouth. No, it, this is all fair game, and I've heard comments like, well, at least Fiber Channel keeps all those network guys off my storage network from a woman at a university. <laughs> but I hear you. I totally hear you. Um, so to make those snapshots user-facing, Andrew, what does that mean you're using iSCSI, NFS, or otherwise? Well, iSCSI doesn't. iSCSI has the same problem. Yeah, same problem. That's hence my question. Because it's a block device. Um, yeah. and, uh, NFS and SIPs. Okay. So, you know, most of the time when I'm talking about this, we're talking about my um, VDI environment, mm -hmm. which is all unfortunately VMware. So I have to have something that's got the, the base actual setups for the VMs on it for the, for the initial or for the base drive that it boots off of. That's going to be a, a uh, disk image. Hmm. So I export that to ESXi. I'm doing that on NFS. Got it. That makes it easy for me to do to do restores on that side. But everything else for these machines is all is all uh, a SIF, is all a SIF share for all like the um, um, Windows roaming profiles, all that crap. Mm -hmm. All SIF shares, and that way the end user can use. Can can go into um, the the shadow volume copy stuff yep. that they would use in Windows. Oh, so that's supported all in, uh, on the all OS? the snapshots come up. Yes. Oh, same thing uh, with Samba and provide uh, VFS modules. You can make snapshots available as uh, VFS, and you can even allow v uh, Windows uh, shadow copies to be created as snapshots. Maybe you pretend to be a Windows file server with yep. shadow copy support and map it to your underlying file system. I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if we've got if we've got the ability to do that. Um, I've never tried it, so you might. But I have a I have a script that runs snapshots every hour, so Same here. it gives um, them it'll give them direct access to whatever they need. I prefer to have the uh, file server in charge of backup rotation and especially creation instead of trusting it to clients well yeah that's what i'm saying is that i've got you know the actual storage server is, has got a script on it that takes a snapshot every hour but uh coming back to exposing snapshots at least uh, with iSCSI you could in theory export each snapshot as a read only target yeah, but you could, but it's it's still ugly. It's painful. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, but at least it's possible. I'm not familiar enough with Fiber Channel to even t know if it's possible. If you have a large enough uh, namespace to work with, to embed the snapshots. Or if you, On that note, uh, Jan, how serious is your MQTT publish? Uh, comment in chat. None at all. Uh, okay. Just. <laughs> okay. Anything else regarding the segue to sharing from NFS sharing? How do we even get there? Cool. Um, anything else on that topic? Okay. Uh, anything else? I am happy to talk briefly about opening ZFS on Windows, but. Uh, you probably have something more interesting. What? Well, it was mentioned uh, half an hour ago that the ZFS resiliency story starts with how great everything is because we have end to end checksumming and parity uh, or mirroring. But then the, and then the next stop up is basically, yeah, and you can run great object storage servers on top of it or something. or multi path iSCSI, but the middle point that people kind of expect it to be the clustering file systems like Ceph, ClusterFS, whatever. This is where maybe ZFS 
is no better than other uh, file systems. These two uh, types of tools are already forced to build their own resiliency. And so it's oftentimes you pay all the costs for ZFS if you deploy on ZFS without gaining much from it because the tool on top of it has to assume your file system is crap and you can't make full use of the ZFS feature through it. So this is where the ZFS doesn't have a good answer because nobody will turn ZFS into a true clustered file system as a network. Well, Jan, well, that comes back to multi-host import where truly clustered, it would be mounted simultaneously with some yeah, and priority scheme uh, between multiple participants and we're not there yet. No, that would go even further so that multiple yeah. systems could have write access at the same time with lo locks across the whole uh, cluster and so on, uh, which is such an enormous project that would probably have the same order of magnitude as the rest of ZFS the, to get all of this right. The only thing I could think of really for this would be writing a new clustering file system that just scratch. doesn't, yeah, from scratch that just doesn't do a lot of the stuff that you don't need to do because you're on ZFS. And the reality is, I'm not sure the juice is worth the squeeze on that. No. Just run, you know, just run your nice, um, I can't think of the clustering file system, like Luster, and don't run it on ZFS. If it's already going to get you all the features you need by itself, not running it on ZFS makes sense. I mean, I know this isn't the call to say that, but that's the reality. Uh, what would make sense for these applications is something which has been asked for, I think, in other contexts as well, and that is a probably quite small change to ZFS. Instead of just having volumes and uh, file systems to have object namespaces where you can have very in uh, sized blocks basically so objects with atomic update semantics uh, in a sparse namespace and well, this if, I, if i remember correctly the theoretically the zpool layer supports that um, so Luster is a perfectly right and wrong example because they do have direct DMU support on Linux, not other platforms such that apparently it talks below the POSIX layer. So that's a, a huge pro, pro, bit of progress unique to Luster. So thinking maybe Gluster and Ceph, and I believe there's some other lighter weight ones. Maybe Ceph was the one I was thinking of. Okay. I well, was um, thinking mostly of, uh, user space uh, object storage implementations like MinIO who yep. could benefit from proof full POSIX file system semantics layer. Let me try to find that. Is that uh, and it's a pretty significant lab doing the DMU work. So let me try to find that link. Uh, okay, so does anyone present have experience with other replicating file systems? It's been a long time. I did some little bit of experimenting with them, but it's been a long time, so. Okay, I found the link. So uh, here's a link for the last, DMU access, I'll put it in chat. So in a way that's a step closer where they're, you know, that's, the DMU apparently is an object store. Well, they're using it and I can bring that yeah, that's up. That's the data management level of ZFS or the ZFS object layer, which can even, and if I understood the layering correctly, it's that basically the ZFS volumes are just a restricted view on the layer beneath it, which requires that all objects basically have to have small integers 
as name and the same block size. But ZFS can already handle sparse larger namespaces and verbally sized objects. In some e email threads I've read years ago, the argument was that basically by the point time you add all of that back in, you have most of the file system layer and there isn't much to gain. I don't know if this is still true. I don't know if it was true at the time. Okay, so for what it's worth, there is a concrete step towards that, but I believe strictly in a Linux specific environment. Although I've spun up Gluster on FreeBSD and with it and had it participate with a Linux based uh, peer, which is kind of cool. Anyhow, so that's a broader topic that let's just get share our news with every but call. Yes, Jan. The reason why people are asking for these kind of features, I assume, is that at even small to medium scale, you can can't just quickly fail over your data if there is no uh, synchronous replication. Because mm -hmm. the, the changes to your large data set are trapped on the disk, so you have to access the storage devices to fail over and get access to the latest data. And maybe what could be done there is to have a environment where maybe you have the using whatever rocks, for example, IceCASI, um, you have a lab environment documented where maybe you can play through all these failure cases so that you can even discuss the problem properly, uh, properly because right now, if I'll find out that there's this problem of what are we even talking about? What's the semantics which have to be supported or whether the automation has to bail out and assume that I can't uh, decide what to do. Well, I don't think we'll solve it today, but uh, do keep this in the back of your head and find resources that... Similar to the image uh, of the JBot, uh, uh, John? Yep, that John posted. This, uh, like he had, is like six digits of hardware sitting in a rack. You can do it for uh, less than a thousand bucks to reproduce all the corner cases uh, in a virtualized environment. Yes, and John, I meant to ask, are you making SAS connections like round trip where they terminate on the same path from this host to this one? I see this little blue line. I assume that each... <clears throat> Colored line represents eight lanes. So, so the, the answer is yes. So if head A, for instance, is talking to a drive on the very top shelf, yep. the a different drive on the top shelf can also be talked to by the by head B. But then and the loop completed here to the other host? So the yes, the loop completes for both channels. And that is safe. Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. And then, thinking back to class. Well, it's, it, it is safe as long as you are programmatically safe. Okay. Um, so, the the one the, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jan. So, if I correctly, if you terminate the book, the loop through basically going out with one pile of four to one mm -hmm. chassis. Uh, you loop through all the multipaths, and I think you're a bit beyond the allowed limits because I think you're only allowed to go three uh, expanders deep in your chain, and you're deeper. No, works fine. There's no limit. Yeah. Well, I don't, where does the limit of three expanders come from? 
somewhere previous you know, SAS generation, SAS maybe. One, yeah, maybe it's only a SAS one thing, but it used to be that you're not that there, this there was this limit. So at least in the specification, I think it was for uh, some kind of latency reason. Hmm. But uh, anyway, if you terminate it on the same uh, HPA the loop, then you don't have uh, HPA redundancy, but the operating system will only see the drive once. If you terminate it on a different HPA, you will see uh, the drive on both paths because the HPA won't unify them at the SCSI. No, if you'll note the comment in the center of the, t in the center text, 200 disk total, 400 disk multipath. So the answer is yeah. yes. They terminate on a different card exactly. so that each disk shows up twice, and then I use multipath to put them back together. But yes, I have to be you, careful about making sure the error codes are monitored appropriately. Exactly. But if you were to uh, have a loop uh, through two par, uh, par, uh, two sorry, let me start again. If you had a loop through two uh, parts of the same controller, uh, the controller would only sh present one uh, disk per disk to the uh, operating system instead of showing the two paths for GM to deduplicate through GM multipath. Understood. <laughs> and the other problem is that I have learned to distrust GM multipathing. That's a whole different discussion. We each have our yeah, but we, we can have another meeting on multifamily. Yeah, let's. Oh boy. Okay. Anything else on sharing SaaS? You name it. Or shall we move on? We are approaching. We just passed one hour. Uh, fine. I'll jump in. Uh, let's do a quick look at the open issues for OpenZFS on Windows. Uh, a a showstopper for me has been recently fixed in a new release, which is 221RC1 that came out two weeks ago. And I have to come up with new tests, 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 new Okay, yep. and Jan, yours has been cutting out every now and then. So let's make a habit oh, of sorry, rebooting all our USB devices. Okay, set up. <laughs> so starting over, the showstopper I saw has been fixed, and there are others that are open. And the recent release was two weeks ago. I invite you to pound on it. I was the first person to use it on real hardware, and that resulted in a few issues. And I learned how to submit Windows crash dump reports. <laughs> which I had no plan to learn. So, uh, da, 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 da. Windows Defender scans. Okay, so high up the level for some of these issues. So, 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 Michael, you're looping again. Trying again, back to Brio. I'll have to rethink that. So anyway, there's my quick, super quick update on OpenZFS on Windows, I welcome you to try that. Um, the people who asked this question did not join, that's okay. And separately, I'd love to talk about the documentation of the encryption manual page. Any last thoughts for this call? Well, I have very much enjoyed using ZFS for many years. Um, I have found it to be quite stable on, on FreeBSD now. It has been stable for me at least going back to FreeBSD 8. On 7, it required a bit of tuning. And it sure didn't have the integration with various tools like ArcStats in top, etc. So uh, I say I'm sure the same goes for the Illumos folks. I've used it for over a decade straight on Mac OS. Thank you, Jorgen, who's done the Windows work. Uh, so yeah, I think we've come to the right place. It's crazy that ZFS is basically the best uh, cross-platform operating system. Uh, file system. system. Yeah. I've oh, been using it since yeah. before uh, Illumos existed. Nice. Uh, on that point, here's a question I've asked at various conferences. So what is the oldest 
tool you have that has been, you know, seen many OS updates and possibly even an OS change? Oh, haha. Let me check. I I don't know if I still have any of the really old ones. I'm honestly not sure. That's what's oh. remarkable about Zf CFS is you could go from so open Solaris onward to this day on potentially Windows with the same pool. That's impressive. I, I want to still have pools which st started out as ZFS nine. I might have some that go back to open Solaris. I would really have to dig because I haven't thought about it. Oh, cool. I'm just curious. Hey, it's it's just proof of the success. Um, so. By that, Jan, you mean FreeBSD 9? No, uh, ZFS, uh, feature level 9. OK. I've actually, though, been trying to completely redo a lot of my older pools, most notably because they were all on um, 512 disks. Sure. So there's limits to how far I, I can expand them easily. Mm -hmm. um, anymore, now that we can manually specify the a, uh, the a shift mm -hmm. for it we set the a shift to 12 and i'm good but a lot of those old ones were made on five on 512 discs that we couldn't do that yep. at, at that time yep yep cool any final thoughts beyond that and there's no way to change from a shift nine to a shift twelve. Right. I would. I would really love that. Oh, you want block pointer rewriting? Um, <laughs> I would not object to it, assuming it can be done safely. Supposedly, according to Matt Irons' performance, isn't that it's impossible that that it would be the last feature ever added, because it would explode the dependencies to worse than uh, UFS soft updates because you always would have to have basically back pointers to track. And then you couldn't change anything anymore with reasonable complexity. Yeah, like I said, the, 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 problem, is, the problem is safety, doing it in a safe way. Okay, on that note, I'll say thank you, everyone, and I'll be around a few minutes. And I'll talk to you in two weeks. Two weeks? I'll probably talk to you in a week. Well, there's that for other production user calls. <laughs> Granted, no question. <laughs> um, but, John, regarding um, GM multipathing, the problem I've encountered with using multipathing that way is that GM, because it's a layer up from SCSI, doesn't know the difference between a medium and a path error, so it will just retry. Yes, it does. And the worst thing which can happen to you is you have, if you have an unrecoverable read error in the metadata of a other provider, like a partition table, because that will stop your system from ever booting again with multipathing loaded, because during testing, the kernel will just keep on trying geom multipathing will try all paths fail them over and try again and so jan i i agree with you totally i do not boot any any of my large scale servers off of their zfs volumes all of my servers actually boot from a uh, a boot pair um okay with, which is ufs Oh, really? Um, okay. yeah, absolutely. I, I did boot off local EFS. The problem was that as soon as the disks are detected during boot, uh, the geo multipathing would stop the boot. And it didn't finish over a weekend. Hmm. It just kept trying to taste the broken disk. And I love the partitioning little tail headers on disks. <laughs> oh, I've spent hours untangling those on a certain ah. storage OS, but I'm um, sure it's handled differently on Lumos. And the other problem is that 
some disks have controllers slash firmware which have terrible performance if you use uh, active active multipathing. So, but if you fail over every other disk on boot, you get good throughput. So active passive and fail over every second. Well, I can't. I can't say that I necessarily know how it works, but I know it um, at least for booting mirrors at this point has gotten really good on the Illumos side of things. Um, back in the open, uh, open Solaris days, it was, oh, it was difficult because we didn't have a bootloader that supported ZFS directly. Mm -hmm. And so then it warped in, then it warped into, we, we kind of had a bootloader, but it had to be on a partition. It, we had to be running ZFS on a partition, which was also yeah. a mess, but now we've got it to where we can actually boot natively on ZFS. And while I still keep my actual boot array separate mm -hmm. from my data array, that's for data separation reasons. It's not because I have any real objection. Actually, it's for data separation reasons and my boot arrays don't have the same level of resiliency that my data sets do. So there's that too. There's another con uh, interesting corner case, which at least FreeBSD and uh, Linux support. And that is without doing a full reboot, switching around the root file system. So on FreeBSD, there is rerouting. On Linux, there is pivot root so that you can swap two file systems. And on FreeBSD, you kill the whole user land, uh, unmount the root file system, mount a new root file system, start a new init without rebooting the kernel in between. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting be for ZFS and relevant because it enables uh, ZFS boot environments to have an unencrypted and an encrypted boot environment, SSH into the unencrypted one, and then unlock the encrypted one and reroute the whole system over. And this, having this supported by the FreeBSD installer and maybe some Linux distributions would be quite useful for uh, rented hosting use cases where you don't have a trustworthy uh, system console because who really wants to put their disk encryption password in the management yeah. system and the KVM system they can drag to your server for half an hour or two hours or whatever. So basically having headless systems with root file system encryption by having an unencrypted and an encrypted data set and using the unencrypted one to decrypt the uh, data sets or partitions. How's your blog post coming on that? Um, I have to admit that I run this for like uh, two or three years in production now. Exactly. And <laughs> point exactly. No, right now you can do it in a, the same ZFS pool without bouncing through uh, MD device. It used to be that there was an assert you triggered by basically re-importing a pool which was already imported in the kernel during right the... Now. What happened is that there was a safety feature which was a bit too safe because uh, the assert detected that, no, it can't be that you import a pool during early booting and mounting the root file system if the pool is already imported, but it was imported by the same kernel. <laughs> Hmm. It was just unmounted, and this has been solved, I think, in 12.2 or so in FreeBSD, and it works also in 13. And before that, you either had to have the unencrypted system on um, a UFS file system so that you did not yet import the pool, or you had to basically create a MD device, pre-populate it, reroute it to the MD device, export the pool completely, and then reroute again. So basically do two reroutes 
so into an MD device and it couldn't Fairness. be a temp FS because unmounting a temp FS destroys it, but uh, you could use uh, the um, MFS tools to have packs copy your boot system over and then double buffer. Okay, but that, that was then. <laughs> this it's is no now. longer needed on FreeBSD at least. Okay. I don't know if Solaris has anything similar. Um, to I'm not sure. That's it's not something I've I've looked into. And the native encryption is a pretty recent concept. Uh, Jan, I trust you've been doing that on uh, Gally encryption prior to native. I've done it on Jelly encryption, and I've tested it with dataset encryption, but I still push for Jelly encryption because at the time the I deployed it, the ZFS data set encryption was so new that yep. I didn't really trust it and there were a lot of issues open. Okay, quick question. Have you depenguinated where you take a Linux VM and I don't know, re make the, um, the swap partition into a jump point or something crazy and achieve this? So it depends on the hoster. If you can upload your own boot system, you, you're good. What's often possible is to basically have used their installer yep. and then um, set up a software raid one at runtime, destroy the first disk, uh, unformatted it and make it completely empty. And then you put an um, in memory install system yep. to depingonate it basically without ever going through there. Uh, the hoster I'm using at least ha supports old FreeBSD versions, so they okay. do have a trough, okay. which is good enough to uh, create the zpool and install a newer FreeBSD version. So it's FreeBSD, but no root on ZFS? ZFS. Uh, they are, they are, so Hetzner's ZFS and FreeBSD support is basically stuck at the tooling level of FreeBSD 10, where they're still ah. using the MFS install script, I think. OK. Uh, any final thoughts, especially from Jesse, who's been uh, silenced by the rest of us <laughs> talking about FreeBSD topics? Uh, nope, I'm good, thanks. Cool. OK, well, thank you, everyone. Talk to some of you in a week and uh, the on ZFS topics in two weeks. It's been a pleasure. Have a good afternoon or whatever, wherever you are. Thanks. Have a good one. Yep. Thank you. You are welcome.